Hello everyone and good evening. Uh, welcome to the beautiful sunny Essex here. Um, what a beautiful and gorgeous day to be drinking the dry white wines of Austria. We are thrilled to have Christina Vess from Reiner Vess here to share her story, um, to share a little bit about her wines um, and hopefully give you all an insight into the Reiner Vess house. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, I'll do a tiny bit of housekeeping first before I uh, introduce. Uh, just so you know, whether you're watching on tablet, mobile or on your laptop, you will have the same functionality. You will have two buttons at the bottom that are going to be of use to you. So uh, you have the Q&A button. We are allowing about 30 minutes for questions and uh, hopefully Christina will get through as many as possible. Uh, so if you do want to ask any questions during this evening's event, please feel free to type them into the Q&A button. Uh, and we will hopefully get through as many as we can. You can also see a chat button that I can see some of you are already starting to use now. Uh, if you would like to talk to your fellow members, perhaps you'll let us know where you're, uh, where you're enjoying a glass this evening and perhaps what you're drinking as well, feel free to use the chat function there. Now, if you are on mobile and you're seeing lots of the chat coming up uh, and you'd rather disable the notifications, it's very easy to do. So if you're on mobile, click the three dots next to the chat button, uh, and then you click the little uh, bell-shaped icon and disable notifications that way. Uh, but please do feel free to boot, use both of those buttons. Uh, in terms of the Q&A, we're hoping that we'll be able to let a few of you answer your questions directly to Christina this evening. Uh, if that's the case, we will call your name out uh, and then one of the tastings team will unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question directly to Christina. So without further ado, Freddie, you're on mute, but if you can unmute yourself, uh, I will introduce Freddie Bulmer, who is our buyer for Austria. Uh, and welcome, Freddie, lovely to have you this evening. Thank you very much. Yeah, nice to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to hear from Christina. I thought I'd just give a little bit of an introduction to how I met Christina and her dad, Reiner. And actually it goes back to 2017 and I went to a sort of a wine trade show in Vienna with Sarah Knowles, who I was taking over Austria from. And she said, oh, I must introduce you to Reiner Vess. And I thought, okay, you know, sounds interesting. And she said it was a, you know, nice small winery and father and daughter kind of uh, team. And I met them and I just remember two big, grins uh, that met me from Christina and Reiner two huge smiles and I thought oh this is lovely already you know and I thought I'm going to get on with these people and I tasted their wines and they were absolutely delicious and I thought okay you know this is something that I've got to take a little bit further and explore a little bit further and what struck me was the the genuine the genuine heart and soul that they managed to put into their wines which was which was just so lovely to see. And I think from the point of view of a wine buyer, it's exactly what you want. It's genuine and it's real people and it's their passion. And, and it was just a, a no brainer really based on the quality of their wines and the amount of passion and love for it that they clearly had that I would continue to work with them more. So it's also frankly, really refreshing to see a father and daughter team because you see so many fathers and sons kind of going at it in the wine world. So father and daughter was a really nice step change, I suppose. And so, yeah, so I am drinking one of their wines, the Creme Style Gruner Veltliner, and Anna, it looks like you're drinking one of theirs too. So I'm really excited to hear from Christina. So um, just as a little bit of background, before I hand over to Christina. So Reiner has had a, 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 well, quite a long career working in the wine industry in Austria. And now the Weingut Reiner Vess uh, company, I guess, is run just by Christina and her dad, Reiner. Christina's doing more of the winemaking side of things. And, and in my opinion, is one of the most exciting winemakers, exciting young winemakers in, in Europe. So it's a pleasure to have her here tonight. So Christina, thanks for joining us. I will say no more and I will hand over to you. Cheers. Cheers. So, um... Thank you all for having me and thank you for your kind words, Freddie. Uh, it's uh, really nice to um, have this opinion to um, or this opportunity to talk to you all. 
and to tell you something about um, our winery. So let's start with um, I did a small presentation for this evening. Okay. Sorry, some technical. It's like we can see your screen now, Christina, which is great. So, so that should work <laughs> now. Um, so sorry for for that. Yeah. <laughs> So now, nah. um, sorry about that. So um, obviously that's the um, team of Rhinovest. So uh, it's um, myself in the middle, on the left-hand side, um, my father, Rainer, and on the right-hand side, um, my partner, David. Um, as mentioned before, we are very small uh, winery. Um, we, um, do more, more or less everything is done by ourselves so it's really family run and um, we have two employees for the vineyards and um, yeah that was it and so now more in general that's where we are located in Austria you have the map of Austria um, on the bottom right uh, you can see Vienna, um, approximately 80 kilometers west from Vienna. Um, at the Danube, you will find this small old city of Krems right here. And that's where our um, winery is located in Austria. And to give a better explanation about um, where we are, so here you can see the Danube. And that's a view from our um, vineyard site, Pfaffenberg. And um, that's also if you would look straight to Vienna. So, yeah, that's the Kremstal Valley. And if, yes, and you would see the um, old city of Krems over here as well. And um, but now I want to tell you something about um, the story the, um, of the winery Rhinoves. I'm very sorry for these um, pictures, but we, won't, we didn't find any better ones. It, they are very old, obviously. Um, but the story of Rhinoves is not a very long one because um, my father uh, founded the winery in 2003. And he always, uh, it was more his childhood dream, childhood dream to um, be able to put um, his bottle with his name on it on the table with, his, with some friends. And um, yeah, he was always working in the wine industry as Freddie mentioned before, but we didn't have any vineyards, no cellar and um, no equipment. Um, but he came to the Wachau Valley and worked for a cooperative uh, for the Domaine Wachau, for former Freie Weingärtner, now Domaine Wachau. And um, yes, and then he started to um, found his winery in 2003 in a small rented cellar um, in the Unterleubner Kellergasse, so a very traditional um, old Austrian cellar street. And um, only he only bought some fruits so as we didn't own any uh thing before we um he had to buy some fruit and yes that's where everything started but as you see it was a very small place so uh, it fast went to become too um too small so we had to um had to look for something else because yeah, um, to give a scale, and um, if we um, would get an, a bigger order in the in the small cellar, the weather always had to be fine because we had to label and package everything outside the cellar door. So um, also shipping and everything has to be done at the, at the same day because we would um, 
we, we needed the street as well. So we really searched for a bigger and better place. And in 2009, uh, we found this old cellar. So now you see um, the cellar um, before we um, did the renovation. So on the left hand side, um, it was a former monastery cellar from the Stift Wilhering in Austria. And is, it is approximately 400 years old. And um, when we decided to move to another place, um, the more, most important thing for us, um, beside achieving um, to um, have just more space, <laughs> um, was that we um, could add a new grape reception, um, which you see on the right picture. And um, the modern part is our great perception and our um, pressing hole. And so you can see here, we deliver um, this small street, this ramp. We, we deliver the grapes in the first floor. We start it there um, and then we crush them. And then they're flying in, uh, falling into the press which you will see in the next picture. Um, so when you came here, the grapes are falling from the first floor into the press or in one of our um, maceration tanks. And here you can also see um, Rainer West during harvest in action. Um, yes, a real <laughs> snapshot from the harvest. And um, yes, here, um, we can decide um, some maceration time. So it comes from the first, um, uh, for, for, for the, for the um, more entrance level wines, it's approximately from one to three hours. From the village, we have five to eight hours. And um, to the cruise, it comes to um, approximately eight, 12 hours. But yeah, that always depends on the vintage as well. So, and we do like um, the grapes in our, um, in our cellar, we go in now from the grape reception to the cellar. As mentioned before, our whole grape reception, sorry, is a um, gravity flow. Ooh. Gravity flow. <laughs> and so we do not need a pump till the cellar. So after sedimentation, um, we need to pump for the fir very first time. And yeah, that's it. And also, um, which is really nice from the old building is that um, we do not need any air condition in our cellar because we are 10 meters um, deep in the soil. And um, that's the reason why we have a stable temperature from about 15 degrees the whole year. Um, also here you can see our stainless steel tanks and um, our wooden casks. Um, stainless steel, we do, um, you, Riesling is produced um, in all stainless steel, but when it comes to Grüner Wettliner and especially for the village Grüner Wettliner and for the Krüß, we use our um, oak casks. They are from 950 liters to 1,250 liters. So now um, we're coming to our portfolio and also to our labels. And because many people often ask, um, what are these three triangles on your label? And um, as my father founded the, the winery, he, um, he thought about the label, the logo, and what he wanted to show. And um, the main thing was, or is always, um, where the grapes are coming from. So the most important thing is that you can recognize or should have a nice idea where the grapes are coming from. So the most important thing is the vineyard, or when you come from the region wine to the village and tend to the vineyard. And so now, if you have our portfolio in front of you, um, like here, you could see on the left-hand side, the Leubenberg, which is still in the Wachau Valley. 
the um, border between Wachau and Kremstal is really between Leuenberg and Pfaffenberg. And then next to the Leuenberg, there is the Pfaffenberg. And next to the Pfaffenberg is the Kögel. So wherever this little um, yeah, slide goes there, um, there the vineyard would be um, located. And yes, and we are also to mention is that we are a member of the Österreichische Traditionsweingüter, um, which is an association which has the same goal to bring um, the single vineyards into a classification system. So, yes. And um, our um, varieties which we are cultivating are now, beside Grunewetliner and Riesling, now also um, Gemischter Satz, Pinot Noir and Zweigel St. Laurent. My father founded um, the winery only with Grüner Medlina and Riesling, but um, in, in, as we could grow because we um, were able to get some new vineyards, we also um, were able to get some new, new old vineyards and that's why we do these varieties as well. So when it comes to our philosophy, um, it's uh, a, ma a matter of feeling here because um, out, right after winemaking school, I thought, okay, everything which is, was um, teach there, you know, um, chemical analysis, everything, of course you have to teach it like that, but um, it was very technical, very many analyses and yeah, so I, but I, I thought it's the right thing to do. And I came um, to my father and said, I have to do all the um, analysis from the whole cellar. And he said, yes, great, do this. And I did it two days of a, a really chemical analysis and doing everything. And then he asked me, uh-huh, nice. But what did you find out? What the, what's the clue? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, yeah, that's why you don't, you have to taste it because if you if you write it down that much acidity or this much acidity you will taste it but you're not is it a good wine or not is it already complete is it ready to bottle it, it does it need, need some more time into the tank no technical chemical analysis will tell you that and i was like That's, that makes sense for me <laughs> and um yeah, that's how, um, yeah, it came also to this philosophy. And also when I, uh, I did some internships and um, when you see some many, many um, approaches how to produce wine, um, I think the most um, popular or best winemakers in this world that just have a really good experience and also love what they do and you won't ever get this from a educational sheet and yeah Nico for that's also why we were really honored um, to be part of the passion before profit um, campaign with the wine society because um, yeah we really um, put a lot of work and love in our wines and um, also when it comes to picking we do um, need a lot of time because we do not want to have any botrytis influence in our wines and um, botrytis always comes, <laughs> even if you don't want it, especially in our area, if you uh, from the foggy um, Danube in the, during autumn, definitely get botrytis. And we do have a long harvest time, especially if you really um, be very picky uh, in, the, um, in the vineyard and then in the winery as well. But that's how you, how we want to produce wine because clean and also ageable and a really good explanation for Austrian Gruner Riesling or Gemischter Satz or uh, Rainer West wine um, in, in all. So and also when it came, because also the question about how we cultivate our winery is a very popular one. And I think it's getting more popular and in the last um, years, 
and because everything is organic, um, biodynamic, and it's much more in focus than before. Um, as my father founded Divine in 2003, um, and have, he has seen many things, and me as well, um, we never used any insecticides or herbicides. It wasn't never a, a thing we did. And um, when we came to have our first vineyards, we um, decided, oh, okay, how do we want to cultivate it? And um, we started working organic. And then one um, spring product wasn't, and we, we already were thinking about certification, um, but one pre good um, spring product, which um, was very good to reduce a copper in impact in our in our vineyards um, was forbidden and that's why we couldn't um, achieve certification organic and then we said no we don't want to do that we do not want to have the label organic we want to have we want to make the best decision for our environment and for our vineyards and we think that's the most sustainable way and um, when it comes to work with nature, um, you also have a lot of, you need a lot of experience and feeling here as well. And um, of course, it won't be only right or only wrong. Um, either you decide. So now it comes to our main grape variety. I wanted to um, get a focus on that. That's um, now a picture of Grüner Wittliner grapes during harvest time. Uh, I think we were on the Kögel vineyard over here, it's placed before the Kögel. And um, you see the Danube as well. And Grüner Wittliner is um, the most important um, white um, variety in Austria. More than 30% are planted here and it's a natural really um, crossing of Tramina and the St. Gerwagner vine in the Burgenland in, yeah. And also um, Grüner Wettliner is, I think Grüner Wettliner is a very great um, variety because you have a fresh fruity wine, which is easy to drink and just sip, sip and um, hooray, uh, the, the bottle is empty, but you can also have a serious crew, which um, improves and improves. And also I captured this, um, Sit up from Chances Robinson because she said you should, um, or uh, Grüner Wettliner could also be like a uh, uh, burgundy. And my, in my opinion, this is totally correct because, um, if you can, uh, uh, aged, well aged Grüner Wettliner in a decanter could be so, so nice and a really great wine. And so, we start with our um, most important Vetlina now. It's our Creme Style DSC Grüner Vetlina. It's, um, as I said, the most important one. And um, we, of course, we say entrance level wine, but um, we hate the word, or we do not like the word entrance level because we think it's our regional wine. It's our, um, it's most of the time the first expression you get from a winery. And we want to achieve that um, the first impression of a winery is already very, very good. And we really focus on that. And yeah, that um, was last year in our Kremstall Grüne Wettliner uh, vineyard. And um, there you see also the main soil here is um, the plus soil. Mm -hmm. So now the um, Krems Alte Reben which is our village, um, Grüner Wittliner, for example. And there is also a um, deep soil. And as you see here, a very old wine. <laughs> Normally, the Grüner Wittliner grape would be even um, bigger than here and bigger berries. And to be honest, <laughs> these uh, vineyards, nobody else wanted them because they are so, um, so, so planted very densely. So you, we can't drive through this vineyard with our tractor. So even though they are flat and approximately one hectare big, um, we can't drive with the tractor through that. 
And of course, um, many people in Austria, we do not have that much experience with this old um, wines. So we said, okay, let's have a look. Maybe after the first year, we recognize not the best idea to do. But after the first harvest, we recognize that's cultural gift we got here. And that's really nice to um, cultivate these mines. And I hope that we will be able to cultivate these wines even longer. And now, now we came to the real stuff. Now we come to the um, Krus. Um, the Vineyard Weinzilberg is really, as you see at the right picture, um, really located in the town of Krems. So really in the middle of Krems. <laughs> and um, Weinzirl was a small village near Krems, which is now, um, now a part of the city of Krems. And um, mentioned very early, 1161st, and uh, it was called the winemaker's uh, vineyard site, um, which is very special here is, uh, of course, that it's in the middle of, this, of the um, town, but um, as you see it on the left hand side, some wines in our vineyards are planted without rootstock. So ungrafted wines, very old wines, approximately 70 years old. And this was possible or this is possible because um, the specific um, terroir of the Weinzelberg, because you have a um, thick um, quillac nice um, soil covered by um, by sandy, um, very sandy uh, material above. And um, that's why the phylloxera can harm the roots of the wines. Mm -hmm. So now the Kugel Grüner Vetlina. And that's, um, this picture was taken only uh, one month ago at the right hand side. We were really, um, Really, really proud and nice now to how the stone terraces do look now because we had to rebuild some of them and we had to rebuild and replant and um, some things over there. And um, because it's a very, very special vineyard. At the top, you find Riesling. In the middle, we have our Kunovetlina. And then when it's getting rockier again, we have um, our Riesling again. And what's um, on Kugel very special is that you don't, do not find only Kvillag nice like at the Pfeffenberg, uh, like at the Weinzelberg before, but also um, slate. So, um, of course, many people of you know um, Riesling grown on slate, but even on Grüne Vettlina, um, you recognize a really nice um, slate flavor, which makes it really unique. So, and now we came to our um, Riesling Krus. It's um, the Pfaffenberg Riesling. <laughs> and um, the first picture I showed about the Kremstal was taken in this vineyard. So we are, um, our vineyard would be really on top over here. So it's uh, really on the, next to the um, forest. So it's really cool, really on top. And Pfaffenberg is a really nice vineyard site next to the Danube. And we have um, stone terraces there as well. And the soil here is um, kvillagneist as well. But with um, Pfaffenberg, it's really cool and a nice thing that it's that um, stony because you have kvillagneist and that's just covered from decomposed Kvulak nice. So there's no much earth, earth or anything. So the wines really have to make a very good and hard job there. And you will recognize this in um, the wine itself as well. So, and now we come to the Leuenberg Vineyard. <laughs> the Leuenberg Vineyard. Um, it's a very special one to me because it was the first vineyard we, um, we were able to purchase on our own. 
Um, of course, we rented some vineyards, but um, this was our first own one. And um, it's also really on top because Leubenberg is um, a slightly, slightly warmer um, vineyard than the Pfaffenberg, um, but still cool. But um, also why we are really on the top. Um, but we went there and visited the vineyard and saw um, the vineyard and everything. And then, um, uh, okay, maybe rent it, yes, yes. Okay, and then the uh, former owner said, but do you want to buy it? And my father and I looked at, looked at us and each other and said, it's a little bit crazy, but let's do it because um, here we also have to do everything by hand. And um, you have, you see it over here, um, you have to um, get a trail, it's a 10 minutes walk um, to come to the vineyard and then you begin with the actual work. So it's um, yeah, really, really hard work, but um, it's such a nice vineyard. And yeah, also Kvulak nice. And if you compare Leuenberg and Pfaffenberg, as they are really next to each other, they are really two brothers. The Leuenberg is the more charming and the Pfaffenberg is more the um, stiff, harsher um, part, which is also nice. <laughs> and yes, um, gonna now. So now, when it comes to the wine society, I also wanted to show a picture of um, one of or two of the events and uh, one was 2017 or 18 17 and 18 and um yeah it was it's always really nice um to attend attend those tastings and also wanted to say thank you for this tonight but also for the nice tasting we already did um before because it's always really really cool to be with you all so that was our um, presentation, yeah. Brilliant. Christina, thank you very much for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, I, I was with you in January this year in Austria, which seems like many, many years ago now almost because of the current situation. And one thing which was a really positive part of the trip, which I just was going to ask if you could expand on, and then obviously we're, I think Anna's going to field some questions uh, or organize some questions. But um, one theme of the trip when I was with you was the 2019 vintage, of course, because that's why I, I was out in January anyway, it was the taste of 2019 vintage. And it sounded very positive. I wondered if you could just give a bit of a background uh, of how 2019 was for you as a vintage. Um, 2019 was a really nice vintage. Um, of course, it was also very warm. But um, during the year, we had also um, some very um, draw periods, but at the right time. So the um, tubes and everything got really concentrated and not only overripe and bold if you would um, wait too long. So there is still nice acidity and phenolics. And of course, we also are harvested very early, but not that early as in 2018 compared to. Okay, and then obviously, since I've been with you in January, there, there's been the whole coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, how's that been in Austria? I mean, I've spoken with you a little bit and, and a, a few people in Austria, but how has it affected the, you know, the, well, making wine, essentially? How, how has that been for you amidst this? Um, it was really hard, to be honest, because everything was locked down, but the vineyards, they do not care about uh, a lockdown. Um, you still need to people to work there, and you have to also do, of course, to... Um, to be able to um, pay the people um, you have to work with. And um, yes, and that was hard, but um, many winemakers um, found some new things to do as we did also, like online shops or some nice um, events during the summer and also planning, I think, um, the whole Austrian wine industry is very positive 
and now we're really coming up and also with the gastronomy they were um, opening last week and everyone was like yay <laughs> and, um yes good 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 well thank you again i think we're going to now pass over to anna who's going to sort out some questions anna over to you absolutely well thank you again christina that was lovely and it's um certainly made me want to book a trip to Austria as soon as all of this is over. Um, having not been, uh, I can't think of anything more lovely than, than sitting uh, on the Danube with a glass of chilled Grüner Veltliner. It sounds delightful. Uh, I would like to pass to Hannah if she is available. I believe she has a question for you. Hannah, are you there? Hi there, yes. Um, uh, excuse my pronunciation, but hi, Christina. Thanks very much for tonight. <laughs> Um, I think you mentioned you're a member of the, is it the Österreichische Traditions Weingüter Association? Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is German A-level coming back to me. Um, I just, I just wondered, are there very strict rules for that? Or is it more sort of best practice guidance? And also, do you think it benefits you from a marketing perspective? Um, the, so um it's more like uh, you have to be invited to this association but it's more like it's um the, the winemakers really focus on the vineyards so you have the same aim to achieve and and then you will be uh, invited and to work together on this classification system and um i think of course it's a group um to um bring the um vineyard in front of the of the winemaker and um, of course it helps also with marketing because you can help each other which all which is always good and, and we are all colleagues so it's good to have those groups especially when it comes to tastings and everything and also to have a a good um a good a few over the region as well and over the special vineyards we have and yes i hope that um fantastic yeah that was great um we also have a, a uh, another question in from andrew and nicholas i think or apologies if it's nicola um if you're there and you can unmute yourselves ready to ask a question not to worry if oh yep they're here oh yeah sorry hello so um on all the austrian wines that i've tried on the top of the cap there is the austrian flag the red white and red and i wondered when did that start? And is that true of all Austrian wines? Do they all have to have that flag symbol on the top? So if it is um, classified as a, as a cultural, uh, how is this English word? <laughs> it's really um, awful Austrian words. It's difficult to, um, but if you have, um, you need to have a certain, so, certificate for your wine that it's a high quality wine and in order to achieve that there have to be chemical analysis and tastings and um, you have to um, get this um, to achieve this um, proof that it's a high quality wine and then you will get the um, the flag of Austria on your um, on your bottle of wine. And I think I'm right in thinking, Christina, Austria has one of the sort of highest standards of that now. So yes. that flag has been introduced to really set the bar to show you quality Austrian wine above all else. Yes, yes. Austrian wine um, law is um, quite strict. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. I, can I just add in, um, sorry to interrupt, but I think, so I just saw a comment there from, from Inbar here, which I think sums it up really well. And, and Anna, as you were saying, it is very strict. Inbar said, that's what set Austri sets Austrian wine apart from many others. There's a seriousness and passion and no cutting corners. And you get it in the wines. I think that's absolutely true. The, the quality bar is very high in Austria. And I think that's a really, yeah, really uh, exciting thing about Austrian wine, uh, uh, you know, as a, well, as a, as a sort of a wine region, I suppose. It's, it's, that's what makes it so special, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, back to you. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Um, I think we've got another question from Beverly and I think she's, she might be ready to ask it. 
Thank you, Anna, for that wonderful presentation and, and those pictures of the stone terraces with um, the Danube, which are just wonderful. Um, you talked about food pairing and mentioned um, Asian cuisine, fish, seafood, and you, you are a long way from the sea in, in Austria and, and Asian uh, uh, cuisine is perhaps not typical. I wonder what um, Austrian dishes or, or, or cuisine from countries neighbouring yours will go well uh, on your recommendation yeah. with the um, uh, Grüne Feld yeah. um, Obviously, I, uh, when I made the presentation in our office, um, I typed something like schnitzel, um, cold horring dishes and everything, and they, um, they said, no, um, you have to do that for English people. They have these ma so many um, kitchens and so many things over there, they can pair it and um, not schnitzel at every corner. But in Austria, um, Grüne Wettliner is with all the sweet, with the water fishes uh, over here, better not from the Danube, but um, with all schnitzel dishes, as I said. Also, um, very traditional Freddy, we had Beuschel with Grüne Wettliner. Um, that was very nice, actually. That was homemade. I, I visited you. Um, this was last year, actually. I think, and we. Ha oh no, hang on. Was this was this this year or last year? It all blurs into one now. Last year. Last year it was last year because I came at lunchtime. Yes, which was very well organised, if I may say so myself, because I had a delicious lunch with you, and that was a very traditional dish. I mean, you can explain it what it is better than I can, but that was a perfect match with Grüne Veltliner. Yeah, that was like. Um, like the Austrian pork haggis <laughs> with dumplings. <laughs> I hope um, that this is... Uh, that it was delicious. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. There's some, some very Austrian pairings there for you. Yeah. <laughs> Beverly, I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Uh, so I believe we have another question from uh, George Cox. George, you look ready to ask your question. Yes, hello. Um, I was just, uh, it's a question actually for Freddie. After uh, Christina's lovely presentation, I'm wondering why the Wine Society aren't um, adding more of the, uh, of, of that particular winery's uh, wines on your list. For example, the Riesling uh, and, and maybe one of the Reds. Uh, and Christina's uh, obviously <laughs> supported uh, that question. <laughs> has she paid you for this? I mean, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's a very good question. And so the first thing I'd like to say is that what we tend to do with um, Christina's wines is always have the, the creme style Grüne Veltliner in stock and then other things, other parcels kind of come and go. So we have worked quite a bit with Pfaffenberg, the vineyard that um, Christina talked about. We've bought a bit of, uh, of Kogel um, over the last couple of years. So we bought bits and pieces really, which we bought in say for a Christmas fine wine list uh, and in fact actually for not the Christmas list the fine wine list uh, the Christmas just gone but the one before we had a whole producer focus on um, Reiner Vess and had a selection of their wines and we plan to do the same thing going forward so always have the creme style Gruner as the kind of the business card, I suppose, of the winery that, as Christina said, it's not the kind of the entry level wine, but it's the first one that people taste to get an idea of the winery. And then going forward, we've got some plans actually to take a bit of, uh, there's a Zweigelt Saint Laurent blend, which Christina mentioned briefly. And so we'll be taking a little bit of that, hopefully before long. We've also bought the Weinzielberg, the top uh, single vineyard wine in Magnums, and we offered that Christmas just gone. And we're hoping to get a bit of that in bottles as well. So, so that's the plan. So, so we, we kind of always have a, it's a bit of a moving feast, if you like, with parcels of bits and pieces coming, uh, coming and going a little bit, but, but we certainly like to do as much as we can. <laughs> Very nice. Fantastic. Um, we also have a question from Peter Casey, and I believe he might be ready to ask it as well. I am indeed. You told us about the wide variety of barrel sizes that you use in your cellar. What is it that determines the barrel size you use in a particular case? I mean, is it by the grape variety, the V? 
um, that also depends on the vintage and the and the yields we get from um, some vineyard size because that's every year is a little bit different and um, but um, it's most of the time it's about 1,250 liters so um, yes that's that's I hope that I answered the question. <laughs> Sounds like it's not exactly, a, like you say, it's not an exact art that you can measure each time. No, it's, a, it's different every year, so it's not, yeah. How do you say, though, from the point of view of, of working with your wines, that's one of the things that is that is most exciting about the winery, is that, that you, you, don't, um, you don't follow kind of a recipe as such. I, I think your philosophy is really such a lovely sort of philosophy to follow because it's really about letting the wine kind of do the talking and I guess that you know one year for, for a particular parcel you might use the biggest barrels you've got and then the next year you might not and that really I think kind of helps to tell the story of a vintage so I think that's a, it's a really nice way to do it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the spy girl um the question before last um, and we have had a few people there's sort of a double-edged question so I'll group them um, we've had lots of fans of Spiegel but we've had a lot of people first of all say that they haven't tried it and would you be able to describe it and then also as a bit of a follow-up question um, what's the future of Spiegel because because it is so unknown in the UK does it need more marketing etc etc um, so um, to the Spiegel thing um, we have it the first vintage <laughs> um, we always, uh, I, I made some rosé out of it because it was not much, but now um, we get another vineyard and that's a really nice old Zweigelt and also together with the St. Um, uh, it will be a nice cool Austrian red because our area is not really popular for um, red wines at all, so we decided when we want to do a uh, red wine it should be a cool, nice explanation of um, our area as well. So um, when it comes to Zweigelt, it's always a little bit uh, very fruity, very um, many cherry aromas and um, sometimes, not, not always, but sometimes more on the easy drinking side. But now we also compare it with the seriousness of Sonora. So we are really um, looking forward <laughs> to this um, blend as well. And I think, um, yes, Twipe just needs some more time, but um, also in Aus Austria, um, of course, we are a white, more white wine grown, except the Burgenland, we're more white into whites. And I think um, Twipe will just, and also, it, I think red wine from Austria in general just needs some more time. Just to, to add something to that, I think Zweigelt is a great variety which in the right hands can be really delicious and there has indeed been some love for Zweigelt in the comments here which is really nice to see. It's, I think there's real promise in Austrian red wines. I think, Christina, you're right that maybe across the board red wines in Austria need a little bit more time but for me in my experience it's just about getting people who make red wine to stop trying to make Cabernet Sauvignon out of Austrian grapes and, and start trying to make something more like Pinot Noir because the 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 um, the kind of the climate lends itself more to the fresh juicy um, yeah. but fresh uh, styles of red wines and that's what I loved about your Zweigelt Saint Laurent blend was that it was much more at the kind of the Pinot end of the scale and and vibrant as opposed to being over oaked and heavy which so many are so yeah, it's, it's certainly, I'd say Austrian red is is one to watch though, for sure, for sure. Phil Dunn has uh, also just said, I like Spiegel, it's like Pinot Noir with personality. So there we go. There's already some Spiegel fans uh, amongst the Wine Society members. Uh, we have had a question from somebody who's unfortunately able to ask, unable to ask, sorry, Andrew. Um, he has said, is it typical for young winemakers to start out renting vineyards? And if so, um, how much control do you have over how those vines are treated? Are you buying grapes or are you just renting the land and, and managing it yourselves, I imagine is the question. Um, of course, at first, um, we had to do it like that because we didn't own anything. And we were, 
we weren't able and we it's a huge effort to um, buy a whole um, winery. So we needed to start a puzzle somehow. And um, we, we started with only buying grapes, then we rented some vineyards. And of course, in the first years, you, um, when you get a new vineyard, you have to pop them up um, with your own philosophy and everything. But after it's also nice that you get a nicer fruit from it um, when you treat it like you think it's the right thing. And yeah, and of course, if you own your own vineyard and it's your, it's like a small child you treat it and you, you think it, yeah, it's just a great thing. And yeah. Yeah, and, and we also, also sorry. <laughs> and now you can see really happy uh, when it comes to the creme style. So even though for our entrance wine, it's all our own grapes, and that's compared to the first vintages, we are really happy to achieve that to have our only our own grapes because it's a um, different kind of feeling to yeah. Absolutely. Um, on your own vineyards as well, and on uh, you do have some absolutely spectacular vineyards. We had another question uh, earlier from Hannah about, uh, particularly on your very old vines and the uh, the non phylloxera vineyards. Um, do you have any problems with those old vines, um, and how do you handle those? Um, the replanting is very hard um, because the roots in the in the um, vineyard with the very old vines, the root system is very very stiff. So um, the old wines do know how to capture their water needs and they won't accept new ones that nicely. <laughs> and um, when it comes to the ungrafted wines, you have to do it. Uh, you can't just plant uh, ungrafted wine next to a grafted wine that won't work. Um, so you have to um, let a shoot on the old wine um, dig a hole, get the shoot in it and wait, and then you have to cut it and then, fingers crossed, <laughs> new wine like in the old days. <laughs> yes. It's a guessing game, I think, isn't it? Yes, sometimes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Crossing fingers and hoping. Yeah. Um, we've had a few people ask this, but Phil Dunn has just asked it as well in the chat. So Phil, if you're there, I wondered if you might be able to ask Christina your question. Yeah, Christina mentioned in her presentation about the botrytis problem. Um, I was just wondering if you've tried producing a dessert wine from those, or does that not work with the grape varieties you're trying? Riesling is very nice doing um, dessert wines off, and we do this as well. And um, in some years when it's really dry, so we do not um, force to get a sweet wine, but we did a uh, Trockenbeeren Auslese, sorry for this German work, um, a TBA um, in vintage 17 and 18, and um, which is nice because with Riesling you have still the acidity and you can keep this wine for ages. And yeah, it's a really nice thing also to do. I didn't mention that, but we do sweet wine as well. Fabulous, thank you. Um, I've got a generic question actually um, because I'm I'm drinking a 2017 it's still absolutely delicious um, obviously you've compared Brina Veltlina to White Burgundy um, and and said how much it could age can you give members possibly a bit of an idea of, of how long you should age Brina um, and particular particularly with uh, reference to your levels perhaps um, so it's now a little bit hard for me because we only are 17 years old but I will be, um, yes, oh, generous. So um, I'm sure as we do not want to have any botrytis, I will be picking very ripe grapes, but healthy ones, that our entrance level definitely will um, be nice for the next five years. And then our village definitely up to 10 years and 10, 15 years for the cruise and further. So I would really recommend also to age them a little bit and um, yeah. One thing to add to that, which I found really interesting in particular when I was with you in January, because we did a tasting of a number of your wines from three different vintages, 
it was fascinating to see how Gruner Veltliner and Riesling from Austria go through such a journey as they age and, you know, start off, I mean, Gruner Veltliner, let's take Gruner Veltliner just, you know, for simplicity's sake, starts off in the first year or so, your, your Erstelager sort of top end Gruner Veltliner start off very precise, very taut and very focused. And then after a year or so, they seem to gain this kind of fat, you know, they, 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 they fill out a little bit and then it's interesting because Gruner then a little bit like White Roan goes through a little bit of a, a sleepy period and then kind of comes out of it at the end. So would you say, Christina, that there are particularly good windows of opportunity to drink those wines or would you say, you know, just open and find out? Hard um, question. Um, I but um, when it comes now to cruise, to be honest, also um, right after bottling our single vineyards, especially when it comes to Corona Bettina, I'm always very disappointed because I would think, oh, they're too bold, too happy, too alcoholic. I don't like them. And what did I did I do something else in the, in the cellar? And oh my gosh. Uh, what's going on in these bottles and then I really deny it to do uh, I've done this and um, then I'm tasting other vintages and I would say now which what is really nice now to drink um, for example is uh, if you have our Kögelgrüne Vettina is now vintage 15 especially when it comes to warm vintages you think, okay, open up, it's nice, everything is there, there's sugar, al alcohol, acidity, everything is good. But if you like that, um, a little bit of time in the, in the cellar, you will um, really, they will lose their baby fat and then you will have the whole, um, yeah, the, the real aim of the Grüne Medina vineyard site and then it shows perfectly everything the wine really has. I love that idea of losing the baby fat. <laughs> they go through, go through the naughty years and then they come out shining. <laughs> um, so uh, Leah has asked a question, but I think her, her kids are in the background, so she's unable to ask herself. So you'll have to excuse my, uh, my accent or enunciation on this one, but um, which sp specific varieties do you add into your gemischte Stadt sucks? Um, uh. <laughs> Um, and yes, she'd like to know which of the varieties you're blending, please. Oh, and now I have to excuse myself because there are some very old Austrian um, varieties as well. So I start with Grüner Medina, it's uh, Rivana, Neuburger, Frühroter Veltliner, um, Muscateller, and um, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. Fantastic. I'm very glad I didn't have to read that list of great varieties. <laughs> that would have been quite something. <laughs> um, well, I think we've only got a couple of minutes left and I think Freddie would like to um, give you a bit of a thank you. Um, I would like to personally thank everybody for coming this evening. Um, and I'd also like to say if you do have any follow up questions, please do email us, let us know. We nearly got through all of them. I'm very sorry if we didn't manage to get to your question. Um, I'm sure Christina will be more than happy to answer a couple of questions over email as well afterwards. Um, so I'll hand over to Freddie um, and I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Cheers. Cheers. Well, I'd just like to say a big, big, big thank you to Christina for taking the time to give such an interesting presentation. I found it fascinating and I, you know, I've been there myself. I've been lucky enough and yet still hearing about it is just a pleasure. Thank you to everybody for attending too. Christina, I am very much looking forward to getting to the winery again one of these days when we're allowed to travel again. And we also look forward to having you in the UK at the next possible opportunity for one of our events. So thank you very much. I will raise a toast to you of your very own wine, which is absolutely delicious and going down a treat. So cheers and see you again soon. All the best. Um, thank you. Cheers. Yes. <laughs>
Thank you, Christina.